Let's pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roka. Jenny David. Yes, here. Scott. Here. Ron Vaughn. Present. Brad Newbacker. Here. Mark Serbrook. Present. Uh, are there any additions or corrections to the agenda? Commissioners? I don't have any. Seems like a pretty long agenda today. Yeah, I, I, I got to agree. Is there anything, and in, in you got me for two hours, and I think you're all pretty well aware of this at this point in time. Is there anything on here? Um, I was pretty surprised opening this. Some of this, I believe, got put on here fairly recent. Is there anything that we're able to uh, move to the next committee of the whole? All three of those policy matters could be moved. Uh, we do want to talk about the surplus auction issue. ORB has been an ongoing matter. But the three policy items definitely are not pressing, so they don't have to be. The other items uh, on appointments, uh, frankly, that's the, you know, up to the speakers, I mean, the uh, sponsors of those. And it looks like those are the most urgent items. Okay, you're good with that then. We'll see where we're at time frame. Going forward, we really need to stick with it. I know we've just discussed a few different times things being put on our iPad by, by Monday. Anything that has to go beyond Monday, I think needs to be moved. Um, going forward, I think we really need to stick to that plan. Um, yeah, believe it or not, two items did not make this agenda. So <laughs> <laughs> I should have uh, took, uh, taken a look at this and, and then asked to move the meeting up to eight o'clock. There's quite a few. There's quite a few things here. I think I'll take the whole lot of. Well, hopefully, hopefully not. But okay. Uh, item two: public comment. This is related to agenda items only. Three minutes. Is there any public comment in the room? Any public comment on the phone? Item three, appointments. 3A, Vicki Rao related to FFA presentation. Hey guys, thank you for coming. <laughs> you have the floor. Do you need us to move? Good morning, honorable judges, timekeeper, fellow FFA members and guests. My name is Addison Cardis, and I'm a member of the Oklahoma Heights FFA Agricultural Issues Team. My fellow teammates are Kate Mater, Kate of Newbecker, Lizzie Bragg, Brian Rao, Kirsten Newbecker, and Mally Miller. Our agricultural issues this year is do we really know who owns America's farmland? On the pro side of the argument is Tatum Newbecker as a local farmer looking to sell the family farm, and Mally Miller as a local real estate agent. On the con side is Kate Mater as a local crop farmer looking to expand his operation, and Lizzie Bragg as a Farm Bureau representative. Kirsten Newbecker will be a concerned local citizen, Brian Rao will be the restaurant's owner, and I myself will be the restaurant's waitress. Two words American soil. These two words alone for many are commonly used to start patriotic feelings. But honestly, they're words that shouldn't be taken for granted. As many of you may already be aware, Michigan, along with the entire US, is experiencing a growing debate. Many wonder, do we really know who owns American farmland? The answer, increasingly, is not the American farmer. As farm consolidation continues, farmers aren't the only ones shopping for the land. When billionaires like Farmer Bill purchase American farmland, farmers sigh. But it's not just the billionaires and the huge domestic corporations that farmers need to be concerned about. That's because today, already over 35 million acres of U.S. farmland is held in the hands of foreign investors. The number has doubled in the past two decades alone, which is why it is resting alarm bells for so many in the farming communities. Before we start our skit, we'd like to give you some insight on our issue. According to a February 2020 study by the USDA, U.S. had just over 897 million acres devoted to farming in 2019. That may seem like a lot, but in just one year's time, farming acres decreased by 2.1 million acres. Take into consideration that the world's population is expected, expected to increase by 2 billion by 2050, which means we'll have to feed more people on fewer acres. With the average age of today's farmer at 59 years of age, many are facing retirement with no prospects of family members wanting to take over the operation, which has led to farms being put into corporate trusts where the runner is sold outright. The National Young Farmers Coalition anticipates that two-thirds of the nation's farmland will change hands in the next few decades alone. 
As of January 1st, 2022, billionaire Bill Gates currently owns the most farmland of anyone in the United States. He currently owns 268,984 acres of farmland and another 25,750 acres of transitional land. He currently holds land ownership in 19 states, including Michigan. All 50 states report foreign investment or ownership to some degree in the United States private agricultural sector. In 2021, the states with the highest number of foreign-owned acres were Maine, Texas, Alabama, Washington, and Michigan. Other states with more than a million foreign-owned acres are Colorado, Arkansas, California, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Oregon. Creating safeguards around how much farmland in the U.S. can be owned by foreign corporations is not a new concept. In 1978, the federal government passed the Foreign Investment Disclosure Act, requiring all foreign entities to report all transactions thus tasking USDA with collecting data on all agricultural land purchases by foreign investors. But more than four decades later, the enforcement of these rules remain on shaky grounds. USDA has assessed a few fines and has found many records contain errors and missing information. Understaffing of the USDA, complicated ownership arrangement, and corporation failure to report their own mistakes are all contributing factors to the learning lack of data available on foreign ownership. However, there were multiple attempts to raise the issue. In 2017, Senator Chuck Grassley introduced the Food Security and National Security Act to bring more accountability to track foreign ownership. However, the bill died before it received the congressional vote. Currently, legislation introduced before the 117th Congress seeks to increase oversight on foreign investment and ownership of U.S. agricultural land. Several bills would amend the Defense Production Act of 1950 to include the Secretary of Agriculture as a member on the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, or also known as the CFIUS. Currently, USDA is not a member. They're an interagency committee authorized to review certain transactions involving foreign investment and real estate transactions by foreign persons. Bills that would include USDA as a member include HR 5490, Foreign Advisory Risk Management, known as the FARM Act, H.R. 3413-S, Agriculture Security Risk Review Act, and S. 3089, Food Securities National Security Act of 2021. States also have the power to regulate foreign ownership of their farmland, and 22 states have their own rules. But again, enforcement can be a hit or miss. Recently, Missouri State Governor Doug Beck has renewed a state-level push to ban foreign entities and domestic corporations from buying up Missouri's farmland. The ban was passed in 1978. But amendments tacked on after the fact weakened what was supposed to be a clear cut rule. Family Farm Action assisted Senator Beck in pushing for these changes in legislation. It would squash the amendments that created the loopholes in the ban. One such amendment allows foreign interests to hold up to 1% of Missouri's farmland if they fall under certain exceptions. Another was added, saying that the reporting of corporate land ownership was no longer required. Only one week after the relaxation requirements were put into place, Chinese owned pork producing giant Smithfield purchased over 40,000 acres of Missouri's farmland. Other states are sounding the alarm as well. Iowa, Minnesota, Mississippi, North Dakota, and Hawaii have been foreign ownership of land in their states, while Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, Nebraska, and South Dakota have gone a step further, banning corporations foreign or domestic from holding a title to farmland. But all of these states have exceptions written into their laws. So even though there has been political action to address this global issue, Powerful corporations have successfully pushed through polls, allowing their ownership of farmland into the very laws that are trying to prevent it. Good morning, ladies. Welcome to Big Bean. Your regular table with a good bar today. Our regular, please. You got it. Help yourselves. Let me guess. Two coffees and two slices of the pie? Yes, please. Two coffees and two slices of the pie. Show me around. Free. Welcome to Big Bean. Would you like a table or would you prefer the bar today? I'll take the bar, please. I'd like a table. All right. If you can have a seat here and if you can have a seat at the bar, here's some menus. Can we get you something to drink with the pie if you'd like? Just coffee. Okay. Two coffees. Thumbs up. I'll be right with you. Here's your coffee and pie. Enjoy. Thank you. Thanks for being on such short notice here. I have some exciting news and I couldn't wait any longer. No problem. What's this news? I have two groups that are really interested in purchasing your farm property. Morning. Have you decided? I'll have a coffee and a slice of apple pie, please. Coming up. 
Here's your coffee. So, Kate, are you having any luck on finding any farmland in it? I tried my ears open, but I haven't heard anything yet. Really? Already? I thought it would take a while. Is it one of the neighbors? No, everything I've checked into. They all want to sell and not rent. And there's no way I can afford what they're being offered for. I can't even come close. No, there are a couple of inquiries on the property from a few neighbors, but most are looking at leasing options and not purchasing. I'm sorry, but I couldn't help but overhear your conversation. Did you see that you have some farmland here locally for sale? Kate here might be interested. Absolutely. I've been trying to increase my operation since my son has decided to stay in the farm. And with another family to support, we need to look at expanding. Would you be open to possibly leasing with the option to buy? I'm sorry, but I've been down that road before. Honestly, I just want to get out from under this and be done with it. So who's these interested parties and are they serious? Well, actually, it's no real local. It's two method groups that are going head to head for your property. As of right now, they're well above your asking price. I'm just waiting for the dust to settle. Do has the highest bid. Really? Wow. You see, this is what I've been talking about. These investors with deep pockets are grabbing a ball of land. What's a guy like me to do? Unfortunately, Kate, little guys like us are becoming a thing of the past. I'm sorry, but what's wrong with investors? When someone sells, we all hope to get the most we can for our property. That's just good business. Congrats, by the way. Exactly. True. But unfortunately, with some of these investors, especially when from out of state, you don't know their plans are at the property. That's true. Exactly. Are they at least farm related investors? I am so tired of watching prime farmland get paved over in front of a shopping mall or another subdivision. Or is it going to become another solar or wind farm? Well, those are all important as well. Not on prime farmland. I'm not sure exactly what their intentions are with the property. I don't want to see my farm turned into a subdivision or shopping mall either. But you have to realize, I'm between a rock and a hard place. I have worked my whole life on this farm with the dream of someday my grandkids taking it over. Unfortunately, that's not their dream. It's gotten to the point where if I want to leave them an inheritance of some kind, I have to sell now before all of my equity is gone. I totally get it. You said investment groups. According to this, there are several foreign investment groups looking to invest in this area. Have you checked to see if they're foreign investors at least? I'm not sure the one might be. I think long and hard about selling to a foreign investment group. You people need to wake up. China's on the hunt. They made massive boom market plays in the last decade. In 2013, Shenyu International purchased U.S. based Smithfield Foods. At the time of the sale, Smithfield had 25 plants here in the U.S., 460 farms, and contracts with 2,100 producers in 12 states. In 2014, China National Cereals purchased two major agricultural trading companies. In 2017, Kemp China paid nearly $46 billion in acquisitions of Syngenta, giving them access to crop and seed protection products. China actually owns a very small percentage of America's farmland. Well, if it's just a few acres and it's not that big of a deal. Really? A few? At the start of 2020, they controlled 192,000 acres with $1.9 billion, including land for farming, ranching, and forestry here in the United States. I'm all for Americans having the first chance at these resources, but when we propose a limit to who can own the land, they're obviously limiting the upside of the current owners. Well, I have to say, this has me thinking. You know, my family's one of those foreign investors. What? We're foreign investors in another country. 35 years ago, my grandparents purchased 120 acres of farmland in Canada from an aging farmer. His sons had no interest in the land, so he's looking for a buyer with the hopes of it staying intact. None of the locals were interested in the land for farming, so my grandparents purchased it as a family vacation spot. My grandparents have rented the land to a local farmer to take the hay off for its cattle. So now you have me thinking. I hope the locals don't think ill of us for being foreign investors in their farmland. Exactly. So how are some entitled to own foreign land, but others are not? Who makes that decision? The United States currently owns over 9 million acres of farmland in foreign countries like Australia, Canada, and Brazil. I don't hear them complaining. Foreign family isn't destroying the land or taking its resources. So who are some of these foreign investors that own land in the U.S. anyways? Well, just offhand, I can name a few. Canada, the Netherlands, Italy, France, Germany, Europe, and Brazil. Oh yeah, don't forget China. The two largest are the Netherlands and Canada. Canada owns most with just shy of 7 million acres, and the Netherlands at almost five. Here in Michigan, 1.35 million acres are owned by foreign investors, with 90% of that being forest. Exactly. I've heard of a couple local farms that have sold out to some Dutch investors. They have allowed the aging farmer to stay on the farm with a life lease on the house, and have kept on all the farm employees as well. To me, that would be a dream come true. Should we be allowing countries that we consider our enemy to be owning land and businesses here on our own soil? Or should it be countries that we consider a close ally? I think maybe we should take a closer look. Well, I don't see China letting the U.S. own any farmland there. I've heard of some foreign investors that are making landlords, as well as some that are terrible. I think people need to be aware and do their research.
Well, we are coming to the end of our time here. So before we conclude, we would like to take a minute to review some key points to just here today. Both foreign and corporate ownership is taking farmland out of the hands of the next generation of American farmers. Pro, farmers are receiving undoubtedly more per acre for their farmland than they would if they sold to local entities. Hi. Many are concerned about how much control China has over the U.S. as a whole. Pro, it has made many people become aware of what is going on right under their noses. Con, many of the crops that are being grown are going overseas to the countries that own the farmland, taking them out of our food supply. Pro, for many, nothing has changed on the farm's day-to-day -day operations. The farm is being run as it was prior to the change in ownership. Con, the extraction of natural resources and wealth from rural communities means that money is not being put back in the communities as it was prior. Pro, U.S. farms and corporations also invest in overseas agricultural farm land. So fair is fair. Con, inflated land prices are shutting young and beginning farmers out of the market. Pro, many believe the U.S. government should not be involved with private land deals. So what's really at stake? Is foreign and corporate investment in farmland a threat to the American farmer? Or could it be an opportunity for growth? Some think domestic or domestic and foreign ownership should be limited as U.S. farmland is becoming a popular investment opportunity for corporations and wealthy investors. While others believe the government doesn't have the right to interfere in private land deals. Just remember, a just food system that works for everyone cannot be achieved if the majority of U.S. farmland is controlled by a few hands. It's a slippery slope. Should the holding of farmland by any corporation, and especially a foreign corporation, own our most precious resource that cannot be replaced? Do we allow our wealth and natural resources to be extracted to the pockets of someone hundreds, if not thousands of miles away, leaving the surrounding communities with little to no access to the resources that surround them? All of our rising farmland prices are shutting out U.S. farmers who want to live and work on the land. So it may depend on where your priorities lie as to which idea you're going to take. However, it is most important to remember that there is no one size fits all, fits all solution like so many would like you to believe. So I leave you with this food for thought. We must remember land is a limited non renewable resource. Thank you, Ms. Nelson, for the presentation. Honorable judges, we are now ready to entertain any questions you may have for us. You sure leave a lot of questions out on the table. On this <laughs> I have a question. I'm sorry. I have a question. How much land does the U.S. own in any of these countries? Honorable Judge, can I answer your question? Please. Um, around 9 million acres. Total? Yeah. With questions for these guys? Very good presentation. Very, good. Very informative. <laughs> Very, informative. <laughs> Very. Very controversial. Yes. I mean, I mean, so who's going to go? to get into government to help change this. <laughs> you guys. <laughs> oh, no, we're, we're, that, we're that aging generation that's going to be leaving. So which one of you are going to get involved in government to, to make these changes? Hopefully our presentation here kind of gets the word out. Okay. okay, I understand. You know, nothing happens overnight. It's going to take years, and it's going to take you guys to become those changers. Well, just in this area alone, the amount of uh, smaller farmers that have been uh, uh, have went out of business in the last five years has been uh, substantial. Any questions for these guys in the audience? Any questions on the phone for the FFA members? We have a question for you guys. Do you guys know that there was that much foreign owned land here in the United States? Absolutely not. Yeah, by the wall, Michigan. Also, I knew about Smithfield purchasing all of those plants too. When is your presentation state level? Next, next, next week. Which state uh, out of, in the United States, which state uh, is has the most land that is owned by? Born. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> sure. I don't. Uh, um, well, Texas Texas has the most amount, and then Hawaii has the highest percentage of foreign land. So, how much is in Texas? Um, <laughs> a lot. Yeah, it just wouldn't be that high percentage because there's so much more land there. Right. 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 Yeah. yeah. Wow. But you said in Michigan. That most of the land was forested, right? Yeah. 
which is farmland too. We grow trees. Mm -hmm. How much in Michigan was it? It was 1.35 million. Is there a specific area in Michigan? Um, it mostly covers the UP because with Canada being the largest and owning it, a lot of them are coming down out of Canada and own the land in the Upper Peninsula. They're harvesting the wood. Where are you guys at? Are you, have you presented at a local uh, or at uh, districts? Where, where are you at with the presentation? Um, oh. We go to states next week. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Demetrio, you want to do you mind coming on up? Whether sure. right here, <laughs> right there. You have a chair. Sit eye level with us. Don't, don't worry about the wire. Uh, how's everybody doing this morning? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Thanks. There's some with that. Pardon me. <laughs> it's old age. Oh, because I was groaning. Yes. Yeah. I got your email, your letter. Okay. I'm just gonna read through that real quick. Um, I would just put some of my thoughts down. So, <laughs> should I begin? Please, sir. Okay. Uh, the, the Rife River Inter-County Drain uh, Board voted on, in December that hearing at the fairgrounds to continue with the process to add portions of Oklahoma County to the Rife River Drain. The Oklahoma County Drain Commissioner was precluded from being a voting member of that board because he owns properties in the proposed assessment district. This only pertains to any matters involving assessments. And I've enclosed a letter from the attorney uh, with her opinion on how that works, what I, what I can be involved in when I can't. So, but anything involving assessment, I can't vote on it. On February 3rd, we met in Aranette County. Uh, we entered into an agreement with Spicer Group to delineate the drainage district, which is about we're not exactly sure because that's part of the process, but it's about 25,000 parcels. Um, and we also entered an agreement with Dickinson Wright, who is a bond council uh, regarding issuance of notes for the, for, to pay for this. The Spicer Group has done delineating the drainage district boundaries and they will compile a roll of the parcels. Um, there'll be a day of review and the day of review is a chance that the people, anybody in the assessment district will be notified of their portion money-wise. And the day of review is a chance for them to come and basically complain if they want. So if, there's, if, they, if they have a legitimate complaint, the correction will be made right there at the day of review. And they use a, uh, what do they call that? Uh, uh, that accounting software. Um, it recomputes it right there in the spot. Help me out here. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, GIS? No, not GIS, but anyway. So that's the day of review. Um, and when they wanna do that in August, because if there's any appeals to that, they want to put it on their tax roll in December. And if they do it in August, that gives them time to do that appeal process, which typically goes fairly fast, so. But it's gotta be, decided it was September, the end of September, to go on the tax by December 2022. So that doesn't leave a whole lot of time. Apparently, apparently the appeal process for things like this, they, they act very quickly. It's not a... Now I had a question on this. That it says, if a landowner appeals a boundary, it is handled by the circuit court. If a landowner appeals the assessment amount, it is, him, it is by probate court. Who's going to pay for that? Um... I'm not sure. I'll have to, uh, I'll Does the individual that that's appealing this going to have to pay for it? No, I'll find out. I'll, I'll get you an answer. I don't know. I, I also had a question. I don't understand this last paragraph. I know the assessment. If there's a if there's any cost to the assessment district, that would be borne by the by the that would just be an additional cost to the assessment district, just like any legal or engineering or anything like that. Go ahead. What's your question? 
I don't understand this uh, this last paragraph that the legal team uh, this opinion that they provided and, and what you're able to do and not able to do going forward. It says uh, the drain code does not disqualify an interest or drain commissioner, which is you mm -hmm. um, for from participating. But then it says you may serve on the drainage board and participate in future decisions that do not relate to the apportionment of benefits for the drain. Isn't that pretty much everything? No, not really. Like the meeting we went to the other day, I voted to uh, enter into an uh, agreement with Spicer Group to do the assessment, uh, the boundaries. I, I voted on that. Was there any other options besides Spicer's? No, but they, that's kind of their forte and they've done a lot of them and uh, I'm very comfortable working with them. So, I mean, you can, you can, there's a lot of people that do it, but Spicer is kind of the go-to well, around here for that. They seem to be the interested party in this project. What do you mean? Well, they were definitely present at the, at that meeting that I was at in August. And, right. and it definitely seems like there is a project that, that is in mind. And it almost seems like they had a pretty big part in in this developing this Ogemaw County. And unless well, I'm they do. they're a consultant that we use and part of the whole process that you have people that that know what's going on and we consult them on a regular basis through the whole process. Absolutely. But they're the ones that the are guy that was at that meeting is extremely good at what he does. He seemed like it. I'm not I'm not I disagreeing understand. with that, but it seems like they're gonna have a pretty substantial financial benefit in this. Absolutely are. Yep. And it kind of seemed like they're the one that spark may have been behind sparking this because to me it seems like there's a pretty big project you mean that we're gonna hear about in the future. You mean they're behind getting Aranette County to do this in the first place? Is that what you're saying? I, I definitely think that they they play a pretty big hand in this. They well, they do, but they have they have plenty of work. They're not out. They're not out uh, ambulance chasing. If that, right. When you look this up online, they're involved in a lot of this that's coming yeah. forward with this drainage district. They're a big firm. <laughs> a big firm. And they do it. This is what they do. I think what she's getting at is Spicer is already um, involved in many projects for the state of Michigan. Many Absolutely. related to this the state drainage districts. What do you mean related to that? Related to the drainage districts that's, that are coming forward. When you do some research online, you mean like you mean like like other drains that are involved in the same drainage district? Is that what correct? You're oh, not the same one. I'm saying in other areas. I guess I'm not. I don't understand where you're going with this. <laughs> it's like a conflict of interest. No, um, it just they seem to have a pretty big financial gain here. They do. They're going to make no, it's going to cost a lot of money to do what they're doing. It's going to cost them a lot of money. It's going to cost Ogemaw County residents a lot of money. It's going to cost Ogemaw County a lot of money. Right. Absolutely. Right. No matter when you do a project like this, there's going to be an engineering firm. And Spicer Engineering is highly respected. And they all charge basically the same thing. So you got to hire somebody. But we didn't do any bids or anything. No. It's called quality based selection. So uh, you don't have no. to get bids. Input commissioner like Dickinson Wright Bond Council is highly respected. I mean, people from your county, I'm sure, know who Dickinson Wright is. Terry Donnelly, uh, Terry isn't involved anymore as much, but they're highly respected. You hire them; they know what they're doing. You don't have any problems with their with their services. I don't disagree with what you're saying, but Ogemaw County residents are the ones that are going to be paying for this. Yes. And this decisions that we're taking out of their hands. Mm -hmm. And this organization is going to benefit huge financially. Again, I, I don't disagree with everything you're saying, but. Uh, well, absolutely. They're, they're professionals. They're, they're uh, highly educated professionals that have a huge overhead with uh, office staff and stuff. And they, they, they have to make money in order to stay in business. So, and they don't charge any more than anybody else. How do you know? Yeah. Well, what would you like me to do? I guess would you like me to anything else, commissioners? Let's get some other opinions. Would you like me to... well, the only thing I'll say about that is everybody's highly respected until they're not. So, <laughs> um, just to say that is is not making me feel comfortable. Well, what would you like me to do? What would be your alternative? I guess would you like me to solicit well, bids from somebody else? Well, that's what we do. Well, you're not required to do that. I. <clears throat> We, we got together as a board and, and, and we, we entered into an engagement letter with Spicer Group. So that's, that's a done deal for as far as putting together this assessment district. Uh, if you as a board would like me to, I'm kind of at your 
<coughs> at your discretion here, if you would like me to go to the board and say, I want to get bids on putting together the assessment role as far as what everybody pays, I'll be, I'll do that. I don't think they're going to do it, but I'll be happy to do it. Mr. Servick. Mike, do you know, um, once they make a determination on the assessment district, the boundaries are, yeah. Once okay. they decide what parcels are going to be included, do they, on the assessment, is it by the amount of land you own or does everybody pay the same amount of the same assessment? No, it'll be, uh, that will be part of the, part of the recommendation that Spicer does for us. Cause that's, you know, again, that's what they do. Right. And we don't have to necessarily adopt their, res their, uh, recommendations, but, uh, it's, it's assessed according to benefits received. Okay. So sometimes if you have a larger area, you might pay more. Right. Because, because I know, I know right. some special, some special assessment districts, everybody pays the same, no matter how much property they own. So I was just curious as to, so they're going to judge it by the benefit that you're going to receive as that's, a property owner. That's the criteria used okay. benefits received. So, and you have to make it because they have this day of review and people come and say, why am I paying this? And my neighbor's got the same acreage as I have and he's paying this right. different. So you have to make it dependable, you know? Right. And uh, for instance, on lake levels, if we put in a, in a lake level where we have a dam and the county controls the lake level, typically if you live on the water, you pay a factor of one. If you live on a back lot with, with lake access, you pay a factor of 0.5. But that's up to the drain commissioner right. to decide that. Once you come up with a apportionment for your county, your county has to contribute X amount of dollars. It's up to the drain commissioner to decide who pays what. Right. And then you have a day of review. Right. And people can come and and uh, complain or whatever they want right. to do. And if right. it's just like you do with property taxes, right? Or a review kind of thing. So similar to that, so yes. You're right. Yeah. This says circuit court and probate court. If you if you want to appeal what if you want to appeal it. The decision that they make. You go in and make the argument. And why they do it that way, that's just the way it's done for intercounty drains. So you said the drain commissioner. So are you gonna be the one that's going to make these decisions for Oklahoma County residents if they come in? No. So you can't have it an or the, this is be, part of this? It'll be uh it'll Will it be? be Terry uh Walters from Gladwin County. Okay. I will be there, but I don't think I'll be the one that makes the decision because it has to do with apportionment. Because you'll have, you'll be disqualified. Mm -hmm. to the, okay. Commissioner Scott. Well, as far as the, the, the uh, engineering, I, I would be surprised if they did put it out for bid, if they get any more bids than Pfizer. You know, Wade Trim's another major Michigan engineering firm and they'll probably have a specialty of their own um i would be surprised they'll bid against them in in this because spicer does the drain stuff uh, among other things um and that's private business and that's gonna find out who, who who wants to bid anything um but you just what this last topic was talking about um where, where do you set on, on should it be a flat assessment per parcel? Should it be a unit based on acreage? Should it be uh, uh, on the water, a, a difference than off the water or? That, that's something we'll, we'll talk in depth about still, but typically the closer you are to the improvements, which in this case are in Aranac County, I don't think that's that's kind of a moot point here because everybody nobody's close to it. So uh, it's probably going to be um, a lot of times if you have a mix and balance description, X amount of acres equals one factor. Say you got 200 acres, uh, X amount of every 100 acres equals one one factor. Right. So uh, that's we haven't figured that out yet. We're waiting to see what. We'll wait until the assessment rolls down so we can see what the, the dollar amounts are. Um, and then we'll go from there. 
you think you'll have input on it, even though that you cannot be in the decision making part of it? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner Van. Well, <coughs> up in up in the north end, the rec area that's owned by the state of Michigan. Are they going to pay into this? They don't have to. They don't have to. <laughs> Of the law they made, of course. No, what I got out of the meeting that Jenny and, and Brad and I went to, Spicer, it looked like they're the ones that built the fire underneath their neck to get this going. That that's what I got out of that meeting. No, I don't I don't think that's true because um I'm sure that I'm sure that uh Larry, the drain commissioner, had, I'm sure he talked to them about it. Because it's it's becoming a this this whole thing started in uh, I don't know 2012 and was amended in 2017. It's becoming more and more prevalent around the state. A lot of counties are doing this now. Until the last 10 years, you couldn't do it. So it's becoming more and more prevalent. And I'm sure somebody put the bug in Larry Davis's uh, butt to to do this. And then he probably talked to Stacy, the attorney, and he probably talked to Ron Hansen. At Spicer and yeah. So. I, I think that was my point. More and more counties are doing this. I mean, you can follow it right online, and Spicer seems to be the one that is everywhere. And I'm gonna agree with that's what I was trying to say, Ron. It does seem like out of the most financial gain, it does seem to be this Spicer that is going to gain the most financially. So that raises a lot of red flags to me. And I and I don't think it's fair that like myself, I live up by Lupton, I live up by the wreck. I have just a lot where my house sits. I sure now don't want to pay the tax that somebody that owns 5,000 acres no. down along the river pays. Hey, easy, Tiger. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's my concern. My family owns a lot of acres. Are they going to have to pay more money? Why? Well, what is it fair for somebody just to have a lot to pay the same as... Farmers always have to pay more. I mean, well, Commissioner Newbecker. Well, I don't necessarily think that Spicer is the only one that's benefiting from this, but I mean, obviously the state of Michigan has got plenty of projects going on on their on their website um, with this. And Michael Gregg is uh, the chairman of the board of many of these committees or boards. There's two of them. He's, he's, yeah. There's only two people that chair all the boards. There's a lot of them. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't know a lot about it, but I, it's, it just seems like it's uh, some sort of an extension of... Uh, Good old boys thing. Well, uh, <laughs> trying to true. trying to build up our roads and our bridges and our um, infrastructure infrastructure all over the state of Michigan. Well, I I can tell you from past experience, if Spicer handles this, you're not going to have any problems. Repeals. Um, so, granted, there's a lot of consulting firms in the state of Michigan. I mean. Northern Michigan, not so many, but you get down south, there's a lot of, because there's a lot of municipal work going on constantly. So and that's what these people do for a living and, th and they're paid accordingly. They all are engineers with advanced degrees and uh, I don't know what they charge an hour. I mean, attorneys are up to about 200 bucks an hour now probably. So um, it costs a lot of money to do stuff like this. Tim, you have quite a bit of experience. Can you give any, can you give your insight please? Well, I, I can say I'm bothered at the thought that only Spicer was considered for this because I know there are a lot of other firms in the state. I don't know if they'd be interested in the work, but unless you ask, you don't know. And, and the idea behind the competitive bid, not only do you get obviously pricing that, that will be at the top of your list, but are there other firms out there that are more qualified than Spicer to do that work? And will they do it for less money? You not had the opportunity to make that review. So it's, to me, you know, potentially uh, an opportunity missed. And I'm not suggesting, uh, my experience with Spicer is exactly what yours is, that they're a great firm. And I don't want my comment to come off as being, uh, uh, that anybody's being unscrupulous. But part of the idea of going out for bids on these projects is you don't end up in a situation where there is wrongdoing, where there is price fixing or something, because we know we're going to get the bid, we're going to charge a little bit more for it. You want to avoid that. And the only way to do that is to get the competitive bid. Well, we've got a, 
we got a bid from Spicer, a dollar amount to do this. So they're they're tied. They are uh, tied into that. I hope it's so, more than just a dollar amount. I hope there's a list of you know work products that you're going to see from it, which I'm confident there yeah, are. We do. I have that actually. Yeah. It's a, um, uh, what their engagement letter, what they're going to do for that for that. But the idea that you know firm B never had an opportunity. I'll certainly pass that along to the board. And that's that's so frankly, it's just a standard best practice um, everywhere. It's not just for dream projects, it, for everything. Is it public knowledge? Can they see that bid that you're talking about? I have it right here. We uh, we actually, and I've been the, I've been in office since '83, and uh, I haven't been involved in a lot of projects, but quite a few, and we've never taken bids on any consulting firms since I've been in office. So that's I've only just, been doing this since 84 and I almost always said well, I got more experience than you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I'm I mean, saying, you know, a yield. That's doing that? your checks and balances. What's I mean, that's I understand. I understand what you're saying, but uh, but uh, it's not uncommon to do quality based selection. It's just you get somebody that you're you're used you're to comfortable with. You're used to dealing with. They do a good job, and you know all the people that work there, and they're competitive in their rates. So How do you know? Well, because I don't, I guess. Okay. Well, no, we did reach out to our legal team and ask them for a, uh, a opinion on this, and I don't think we've heard back yet. No, um, and I'm sure Mike will tell you the same thing. This is a very complex system, and in one of the conversations Mike and I had, at this point, it's it's a done deal. And once these projects get going, literally the drain commissioners, in this case, the inter-county drain becomes sort of its own municipality. They're calling the shots on everything. Uh, and it's it's just unfortunate that frustration's been there for decades. I don't know how to fix that. But we uh, still, just, to the residents, to get an illegal opinion. Right, yeah. One, uh, one more question. Um, you said you have a, a dollar amount for Spicer. Uh -huh. When did you get that? When? Yeah. Uh, we when we entered into that agreement on the third of February. What is that yeah. dollar? Did they? When did they start preparing that bid? You want me to make some copies of this real quick and give it to you? Please. Well, yeah, yeah I'd like that, but um, I'd you want to run the copy when machine. They I do. Working on this bid because that was a question at our meeting as to well, what you. kind no, of just uh, that, money. I think just I think just this here is all they need right now. So, well, maybe the first two pages. But this is the only thing that the engagement letter right here. So, uh, the, one of the questions um, at that meeting was if Spicer was already involved and if they were already um, putting together a bid for the project that they had in mind. And at that time, I believe they say, stated that they had no project in mind. Well, they didn't, I don't think they spent a lot of time on it. Uh, until after the December meeting to make sure it was going to, there's no point in them going forward with it until they know that there's going to be a drainage board. But uh, um, so they had an idea of what they were going to do. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. I mean, this has been going on for a well over a year. And I know that uh, Spicer, the people that work there, I network with them. And anytime I got a question, I call them and they give me advice. You know, there's no fee for it or anything like that. So, but uh, same way with the attorneys. Like you say, you get comfortable with them. There's a reason you get comfortable with them because they, they take is, care of business. It's not a good way to, to do business. Well, that's an opinion. It is. Well, whose money are you using? Yours? I understand. Well, part of it's mine. I got a bunch of rental property, so I'm paying just like everybody else. Tim, would you touch on the, uh, I didn't say anything about that, but part of this Part of this project is going to be updating the GIS for the county and the benefit that's going to right. be the county. The work part of the GIS component, the mapping, if you will, that goes into this, and it's intense. Um, they will go through and do uh, you know, topographic mapping. They'll likely do some soil work. Uh, obviously, all the parcel work will be involved. Uh, many different layers of data that will go into that project. The uh, district will share that information with Ogemaw County. So literally we'll get a data dump. All of that data will be available, say to equalization or to, to planning and zoning if they uh, have use for it, um, that will be accessible to everybody that way. Um, Randy will be here um, probably in the next few meetings to talk about uh, 
GIS contracts. Uh, and this will definitely play into what will then be able to be made available, not only to officials, but to the public at large. And then there is value to that, no question. Right, and that's gonna be all incorporated into the project. Uh, some of the work that they'll do will involve aerial photos. So when they do the topographic mapping, I think they've got that down to uh, margin of error of something like six inches, yeah. which is incredible. We used to say, you know, if you're within 10 feet, we're, we're good. Six inches is pretty good. Now, will anybody ever have need for that level of detail? Who knows? Uh, but if there is a, a later on a, a sewer or water infrastructure project that goes into play, that data will be very valuable. Mr. Sober, did you have something? No. Oh, I thought you did. No, I just, I, I'm just reading this and I'm really impressed they're going to do a letter. Uh, this lie over Veronac and Does the inter county drainage district own land? Do they own land? Yeah, do they own land? What do you mean, do they own well, land? I'm just trying to make sense of this um, part of your letter there. It says the attorney, or I'm sorry, this is on uh, Michigan.gov. Um, it says the attorney general has given the opinion that lands owned by an intercounty drainage district, which are used for drain purposes, are exempt from property taxes. I'm not sure. I'm not, I don't understand that. I'll find out. But land owned by intercounty drainage district. I don't know. Good question. I have no idea. Well, it'd be a government entity. They don't pay property taxes. If they did. Well, they had to say that. So. They do. The, if they there's, did, there'll be an assessment for more tax money being paid back. There'll be an assessment. Pocket, part there. of this assessment, there'll be an assessment for county roads. The MDOT will pay an assessment. Municipalities will pay an assessment at large for public health. Yeah. So those take money out of one pocket, shove it in the other. On public roads, it's based on their 66 foot easements to land in the district. And that'll be up to the county commissioners whether they want to build it. They can build a road commission 50 percent of that i think is how that works i don't know the exact formula it's up to the county commissioners county that commissioners that fill that or the drain commission no the the county will the county will be billed for it and it's up to the county commissioners to decide whether they want to pay road commission to pay for half of it oh boy that's a i don't know what the 51a or something like that they call that Remember well, how many what? parcels were about? Roughly. Again, they don't know for sure, no. but about 25,000. 25, and Ron, way up where you're at, I wouldn't get too worried because it's probably going to be the initial one might be a little higher because all this expense is being incurred. But after that, it might be like maybe a dollar a year. Sometimes it might not be anything. There'll always be an assessment roll. Some years it might be zero, but there'll always be a line item on your taxes. But right. some years it might be zero. Right. Mr. Newbecker, did you have something? Thank you, Mr. Demacio. Thanks for the update. You're welcome. Um, Continue to keep us updated? I will. So there was a couple of questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Get a chance to write them down. Somebody asked me a question. I didn't know the answer to it. Was it you about who, who pays for the appeals? Yep. You've got circuit court and probate court on here. That is one question I'm sure we're going to be getting from our yep. constituents at these township meetings. Be honest with you, when when they get their assessment, it's not going to be worth appealing. I don't, in my opinion, I don't think so. We'll see. We'll find out. But uh, in most most cases, it's not going to be worth it. It's not going to be worth the appeal. But because what did you mean by that? The amount is going to be so small; it won't be worth it. But if they don't have to pay it, well, are they going to spend hundreds of dollars on appealing it for a ten dollar? But that's my question: Who's going to have to pay that hundreds I'll, of dollars? I'm, I'm going to find out. I'll find that out for you. Okay. Other questions that he can take back was was he also uh, the bidding process? Yeah, I'll I'll bring I'll I'll uh, ask them about that, and I will be, let you know what their response is. Anything else? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Have a good day. I'm going for coffee with Craig's buddy now. Bill, you're up next. Hi, right, Mr. Demacio. See ya. Thank you. Hey, Mike. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Phil Durst. And this is Penny Paya. Penny is the new director of the Oklahoma EDC. Uh, Penny uh, 
I believe you got her bio. So she comes to us uh, not only uh, with qualifications. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, she comes to us uh, with enthusiasm and ability, uh, and, and we're very pleased to have her on board as our new Ogoma EDC director. At our January meeting, the board elected officers uh, for 2022. I was elected as a president. Uh, the vice president is Rich Castle. He's with Consumers Energy, Adel Rich. Our treasurer is Ray Stover, president of Mid Michigan, uh, My Michigan uh, Health. Uh, and our secretary is Elizabeth Grabo. Of course, Commissioner uh, David sits on our, our board as well, and we appreciate that very much. Um, just a couple of, of things, uh, and, and I'll We'll be glad to answer questions, but I know your time has, has been taken up quite a bit this morning. A couple of things that I want to mention to you, though, is that we have a revolving loan fund. We are right now in our, our, our first application period for revolving loan. We got a, a grant from USDA Real Development that uh, funded the primary uh, portion of that. We also have some, some small donations, $3,000, not being small, um, so, but compared to $95,000, uh, some some lower donations that, that also have been added to that. Uh, we will keep looking to add to our pool. We have a pool right now of $115,000 to make business loans. And these business loans are, are for anybody. That, so right now we're in application period. We anticipate having four application periods a year. Um, so at the, the pool obviously determines how much we can loan out because we can't loan out more than we have. And I just want to say that ARPA funds could be applied to our Revolving loan fund pool, which benefits business development in the county, throughout the county. And so we, we I do want to encourage you to consider that as an ARPA um, fund use. Um, speaking of ARPA, we are, MSU Extension is working with the EDC to uh, have a ARPA um, session on March the 9th. Yeah. 9th. Next Wednesday, March 9th, we're having two sessions actually, one in the morning from 8 to 9.30 and one in the afternoon from 5 th 5.30 to 7. 5.30 to 7. Uh, they're, they're the same session. It's just giving people two options. We bet the evening session will also be um, available virtual. online, virtual. So uh, this is uh, uh, just opportunity to understand the rules about ARPA and to facilitate discussion. Uh, we hope to be able to help townships work together on things. Frankly, you know, this, the issues that, that many are interested in don't end at township lines. And, and we want to help townships work together and to coordinate those efforts and to help them in this. So, um, Penny, would you like to say anything? Because I dominated so far. No, you're fine. <laughs> Just that with the um, ARPA sessions, we are doing RSVP. They're going to be located at the Michigan Works office so we can take advantage of some of the technology that we have there. Bring that. I did. So you can just RSVP if you're interested in going, you can email me and let me know and I'll add you to the list and let me know if you wanna to come to the evening session and we'll prefer virtual and I'll make sure that you get that link. Okay. Are there any questions that any of you have? Oh, uh, there was one other thing uh, that was the reappointment of Joe Carrara. Uh, Joe is the superintendent of Wilmer Prescott Schools. Uh, Joe's appointment was apparently um, up in December. And um, thank you. And um, so we asked for a reappointment of, of Joe Carrara. That was one of the two items that got put on the next town okay. meeting. Okay. Yeah. Tim sent this, forwarded this to all the townships. Great. Okay. Well, and so. I think it was a repeat, but that's okay. Or, I bring everybody with it. That's exactly Absolutely. right. Absolutely. And um, our website is now up to date. So all the information for this, as well as the revolving loan fund is on there now. So. I copied the road commission that I attended their meeting yesterday. And Thank you. Told them about it because they're trying to do the same thing as tap our, our funds. Perfect. The Ogma EDC after our one. <laughs> the Ogma EDC is is truly working to help businesses in this county, and, and just we, we appreciate the privilege of doing that. We do it, by the way, a lot less than two hundred dollars an hour a minute because <laughs> <laughs> we're a volunteer board. <laughs> Obviously, our director is not volunteer, but we're a volunteer board, and, and just to remind you that uh, that's what makes this county great is, is, is volunteerism in this county. 
Anything else? Thank you very much Thank for the you. opportunity to be here and for the time. It's good to see you all. And um, please don't hesitate to contact myself or Penny about any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Item 3D, Randy Booth, Equalization Director, related to re remonumentation contracts. Randy's not here, uh, but he did send uh, requests to the legal team to prepare the contracts, which are loaded onto the iPad. So that's that's what he needed to talk about. Um, those uh, contracts are usually uh, signed and ready to go uh, by spring so they can begin their surveying. So um, I'm sorry, Randy isn't here. I assume he submitted these because he felt they were ready. So you'll have a discussion with them and see what the plan is? Um, yeah, I mean, he may have just bought himself two more weeks okay. um, because otherwise it would go on for next week. And I can't tell you that for sure that they're ready. Okay. Was, did, was he aware that he was on here for appointments? He has to be, so okay, yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Item 3E, we have Brian Gilbert, Sheriff, related to vehicle lease option. Hi. Morning. How are you guys? Fantastic, thank you. So we come up with this idea here for the vehicle replacement. Um, remember, part of our budget and what we talked about before was uh, two vehicles for this fiscal year. So this is an option that we wanted to talk to you about, about doing a vehicle lease to offset the cost of one of the two vehicle purchases. So uh, Deputy Vetter has done a lot of the research related to this, put together the numbers that you should have received uh, as far as the grants and the lease money that would come from DNR to offset the costs. Should have received my memo that kind of just summarized for talking. Um, I'll go into the numbers a little bit. Sure. What this is is DNR will pay for a lease payment, but they will not pay for a purchase payment because the state of Michigan doesn't own a vehicle, they're all leased. So that's all they do is lease. With that, you know, if we can get basically eleven thousand dollars from them to go towards purchase price of the vehicle, it takes that much less money to get to cover it. At the end of the, the three-year lease, for a dollar, the county owns that vehicle. Uh, there is no mileage restrictions that can be. There's none of that. It's just a you know, it's a one-time year payment. The upfront cost, as you can see, it would have to be covered off with equipment and everything. But after that, it just would be a yearly payment on it. With that, it's a good thing. Like I said, it saves county money. Always a good thing. Um, gets us a second vehicle for towing, which is what we're kind of looking for. In the summertime, we're, we got a full boat and we have to pull an ORV on the weekends. So that, this vehicle will be utilized for that. And then throughout the week, it can be utilized as a normal patrol vehicle or sheriff can drive it or whatever. You know. um, but it can be utilized for that as well. As long as we have that vehicle for the weekends to, to pull our stuff that has to be pulled, then the rest of the time. And the, the nice thing is, is that when those miles, the counter, the DNR also pays for the, the gas and the oil maintenance on that vehicle while it's being used as a tow vehicle. The rest of the time, it's just a county, it's just like a normal county car where the county would incur the cost. This is an opportunity to get a towel. Uh, the Tahoes right now are rare, and with the exception of these two that are currently available from Ber Berger uh, Chevrolet, it's going to be well into 2023 before we see the next round of towels. Uh, so this would this one is available. This 2022 towel through Berger. Um, 
again, it gives us a second tow vehicle for ORV and for Marine Patrol for towing those different things needed for the patrol and whatnot. Um, we do have 60,000 in the 301, which is the sheriff's office budget. We did, we, when we put the budget together, we did put it for two vehicle purchases. So we do currently in the budget have money for a vehicle purchase that would go through this program. Um, the questions will come one, when and if we get the USDA grant opinions back. Uh, those are up the chain to uh, the higher ups to make a decision on that that you know once we get a decision whether they're going to fund the usda grant then we'll have to make some decisions as far as the second vehicle and that type of thing but as far as this program we have the money in the budget um the dnr lease program it would give us you know some money to offset the cost of just outright purchase at the end of it we would own that vehicle when you say dnr do you do you mean the marine grant would be actually through the three grants. So we would submit each grant as we submit them would right. have the lease program. So each grant uh, individually would put a portion to it. So a three month increments. So Marine, ORV and the snowmobile would go towards the lease payments. But how I read that was the Marine grant is the only one that will allow. No, no, it's, it's all three. All three. The ORV, Marine. He, he will allow the purchase yes. or the lease of a vehicle yeah. is just that Marine um, grant. The other two just are maintenance on a vehicle. Did I read that wrong? Uh, maybe. I read it somewhere. But yeah, it's the way it's broke down is it's actually every four months for each grant for $300 per month so for a total $1,200 each grant per year. So you're looking at $3,600 per year to go towards that vehicle. Exclude in plus gas and oil. Because there's three grants, correct? The Marine right. Snowmobile and ORV. Correct. Yep. So I thought I thought the Marine was the only one that would actually. No. So I was concerned a five thousand dollar grant, which that grants typically five thousand dollars. We utilize thirty six hundred dollars of that. We only have fourteen hundred dollars left for wages. No, totally. That's all, totally. Um, the the vehicle lease is totally separate from wages and stuff. So, right, but it's got to be taken out of that five thousand. We're only we're only allowed five thousand dollars for that grant plus. It'll pay for extra mileage and leases. So that's additional money. Yes, yeah. it's additional. Okay. But, but there's only additional money we're going to receive from the state, or are we right. still capped that's, at the five thousand? Well, no, there's no cap. Yeah, let me. But, I signed it. We, yeah, we receive and we get. All the paperwork right. each year, you know, grant and let's just use five thousand dollars and let's right. let's sure. tag it to I don't mm -hmm. know marine whatever you want. So, are you saying that the there, there will be an additional twelve hundred dollars that will be submitted by the state, so that becomes sixty two hundred instead of five thousand? Yes, that's correct. Plus whatever gas and oil that's used while that vehicle being used as a tow vehicle for the so they'll pay extra and they'll give us extra money for gas and oil for yes. that vehicle for that vehicle as well. Okay. Yep. That's that's kind of why I realize the county hasn't really done that before in the past, and that's why we're trying to start utilizing this because it's just more money for the state instead of the county. And, and Paul, so, you mentioned sixty thousand dollars in the three hundred one budget, but you wouldn't need sixty thousand dollars because you're only going to pay for yeah. like a quarter of it, or, well, that, or that was what twenty percent or whatever it is. That <laughs> the, should we get the other USDA grants? Mm -hmm. And that will be also be utilized for those vehicles, right? So, you know, the advantage to doing this is that you don't have the entire cost of the vehicle in a single budget right. year. You can spread it over five or four or whatever. Right. Choose. Yep. Okay. So you're saying, sorry. Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Scott, go ahead. Okay. You touch on some points here. Mm -hmm. I like this lease option. But in order to really do this, we're going to have to change the culture of how we buy. Because we don't want to get into a lease purchase on one or two vehicles and that's it. And then we go back to buying because now we got four years of payments to make. <laughs> one question I have, Tim, is if we set up a special account that we take an allotment of this year 
uh, for $44,000, throw it in this account. The next four years, those payments will come out of that account. And then next year, we, we take whatever we allot for vehicles and throw it in that account. So we just keep drawing our payments out of an account that, right. because That's otherwise, true. if we're going to, the problem I run into is if we cut back on the, on the draw, we put the money in right now. We know the car is paid for. It's just going to take four years to do it. Yep. And then next year, whatever we put in, whatever we allot for vehicles, we put in that account again. You know what I'm saying? That, that's one way that it could be done. Uh, what I, I know some of my colleagues will do in their budget years is just, uh, well, we use the sheriff's office as the example. We have a vehicle line in there. Instead of beginning the 2023 budget process at zero, they're going to start at at least $10,000 because we know we have that obligation that's in there. Right. Okay. Right. And that we try to do with all the contracts that we have sometimes more successfully than others. If we know we're going to have an expense in this area, um, and we have several multi-year contracts so that we just have to make sure that we budget for that. So it's a discipline, frankly, starts at the department level through me to eventually the board to make sure those costs are accounted for. Right. Uh, well, because we have the this obligation. Year, this year, in year four of this lease, we have now started three more leases. Right. So the payment this year is say $11,000 for one car. Next year, we've got two cars on the hook and we're paying $22,000. Or if we escalate it to two more cars, 33, 44. By year four, our payment is going to be $150,000 because it's going to compound. So my question is, do we start dumping this money into a separate account? So in, in, in four years from now, that account sets at $200,000. Definitely could set up a separate fund that just addresses vehicles. See, if we're 60000 this year, we dump that into this account. If I just go by four years, that's $240,000 will be in that account. Those and those payments, well, those annual payments come out of that, right. out of that account. And I know that car is paid for four years from now. Now, thinking broader than just the sheriff's office. Oh, yeah. yeah. Vehicles like in building and zoning, and we had, you know, equalization had one. Right. Any of our vehicles would be eligible for this program. So we could have an e single fund that deals with vehicle leases, and we do exactly what you say, okay. make sure that it's funded each right. year. Uh, to the level that's needed and, or you know as you said put the entire amount in there and that's where it stays until the vehicle is paid off and then we monitor it because you know, things happen the other question i got on that no usda will they pay for the leases or will they have that's to purchase purchase. the car and that's kind of one of the things i want to start. the usda grants in this totally separate Okay, um, well, that's what I'm saying. Either one of them has any bearing on the other. Uh, I, um, but what we traditionally have used USDA. Sure. Okay. For purchases. For purchases. Yes, they won't go for a lease. They won't. Where so the state will only go be, for a lease and not a purchase. Okay, so if we change the culture of how we buy vehicles, then we're going to walk away from USDA grants. Absolutely not. No? Uh, why would we? That's well because I'm taking all my vehicle money and putting it in an account to pay for leases. There's nothing saying that we have to keep leasing vehicles either. Oh, no, there's nothing saying that, but if we're gonna, it sounds like a good deal. It is. Um, most and, counties actually do have three, four, half a dozen cars on these three year leases, and then at, at and the end of the three years, they just get new and they really then another account that they're buying cars, right? So, so. A lot of them, they just, they lease their vehicles. The patrol vehicles oh, are all I, I get it. I get it. Um, yeah. No, no. Because it makes it easier for budgeting because they yeah. know every three years they're going to get new cars. Oh, yeah. Instead of, well, are we going to replace this one or not? They know they're going to replace it. Well, that's, so that's kind that's of my like, question on, right. on, on, do we set up a separate account so we can front load that money into it, you know, and then we know that we're paying off those vehicles down the road. Right. We know the money's there, and the, right, and, and that bill will get paid. Right. I, I totally and agree. And it's not only just for our 
are safe, but you can you can feel in your in your office, sure. you can feel assured that that there's a future on buying vehicles, right? And you don't have this crap shoot every time you come here, right? And then and then on top of that, then maybe somebody will start building some trust between office and commissioner. Commissioner Sir, did you have a comment? I no. The only thing that bothers me is that in the, it's just it's the interest rate. That is crazy. Yeah. You know, and I I understand that it is what it is, but my God, you're looking at you know six percent interest rate. Yeah. I don't, I don't lease vehicles. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. when it's all said and done, it's that's, they're going to be paying about eight thousand. That's three. We're going to get from, but for four years. No, three. That's for three. Well, for three. Well, six point oh zero four. Yeah. Four. Right. But I mean, that's when you look at it. It's not like a uh, mortgage. It's it's simpler interest than that but the thing is is is, is uh, uh it's a trade-off i think it's a trade-off to, to for the lease oh, and, I, and that's on unlimited miles it's right. not like the yeah, regular exactly. lease right. i'm looking that's, at this wrong i guess how i read this was you're going to be pay for this again i think the lease is a good option but i'm just wondering how we're going to pay for this how I'm looking at this is the Marine, the we, we get three grants, correct? correct? The snowmobile ORV and Marine grant. Yep, $1,200 each th per year. Oh, I thought the Marine grant was five grand. That's what we're, I'm sorry. This is what we're allowed for this lease. And how I read it was the ORV and snow, snowmobile grant were just utilized for operating and maintenance could not be used for purchasing. No, the right. Marine could be used for purchasing so are we looking at combining all of those grants to pay for this vehicle? No, they're, they're individual grants. Each one will cover a three month period is what he's got oh. set up. For, okay. Uh, so each grant will have that additional money put in for the lease. So between the three of them, even though two of them overlap, Marine yep. and ORV, each one of those grants individually will pay for that period. That's, that's how the state wants us to break it down. Um, according to Richard Kennedy, who's in charge of all the DNR grants, I've been in discussions with him on this. Um, that's how he would like to see it broke down, make it easier for him. If we put in $300 per month for four months for the Marine grant, and four months for the ORV grant, and four months for the snowmobile grant, obviously we're going to be using the Marine and ORV more than just four months, but basically we're going to get $300 a month for 12 months out of the year. To so to make sure there's enough funding there for maintenance, for to pay for that individual that's doing it. And yep. how many, do we need another, how many vehicles are over there? Do we need another vehicle? Are we short on vehicles right now over there? Well, yes and no. I mean, the, the part of the problem would be one replacements. So we've okay. got three vehicles that are 150 or approaching 150. So we're going to look to phase those out as part of the program. Two, when we do get bodies hired here for the two vacancies, we're going to need an additional cars uh, for the extra manpower that's going to be out there so it, it's just kind of the program so make sure we have safe vehicles for the patrol and everything um, just want to make sure that this vehicle is going to be primarily used for these this purchase this this purpose the purpose of towing and absolutely yeah. for the marine for the snowmobile yeah, um good. and for the orv i that, mean that should be the primary the, purpose absolutely. primary purpose is a tow vehicle second Will be utilized as a as a patrol vehicle um, when it's not being used as a tow vehicle. It could be, it can be, it may or may not be utilized as a patrol vehicle. Because you um, said you said weekends, you threw out there weekends. Is that the only time that that no, we, generally on the weekends? I mean, we're running at least Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but we're running Marine and RVs. Um, so we're going to we, that's two vehicles. That we're hopefully, if we get the one USDA grant with a pickup, that'll take care of the one. This vehicle will take care of the, the second. We're hoping to, to try and keep miles off the normal patrol vehicle fleet. So we don't have vehicles 150,000 miles on them out there. The guy is running hard across the county in them, you know, if it's a safety issue. Um, they don't make cars like they used to, obviously. I mean, the days of making going better. Huh? Commissioner Vaughn, did you have better. something? Yeah. No, I'm just, <clears throat> what? I, I I understand what he's saying, and and uh, I say if you can if you can get the if if you can get this lease going program, like Commissioner Scott said, and then also the USDA 
um, somehow you're going to have to split the split the funding so that you can cover both these. Again, you know, I I understand their mileage and whatnot. I I used one of their vehicles to when when I was in the academy to go down to Mount Pleasant. It was pretty atrocious. <laughs> <laughs> I think I drove it one time and said, never again, that won't happen. And yeah, you're sending officers out in, out in these vehicles. So they do need to be replaced when they get so many miles on them. Commissioner Becker. Couple of questions. Um, so if we do use light, or use this um, vehicle or other things, um, how are you gonna track or um, are you gonna track the gas and oil used for our purposes versus the towing purposes. Right. It's logged on, logged on. Yeah. It's on the log. So when he turns in like a marine log, it has mileage that start and finish. And then when he fuels up, it's under his gas card. So that's how we track and, and do the individual line items for marine grants. And yeah, that, that's not. <clears throat> so we do that already, if you will, for the so different he grants. And fills up. That's going to be put under towing. Yep. It'll be put under the Marine Grant. So marine was, what it was used for a shift before that? I mean, how would we track that? The deputy then would use it during the week. If he uses it for general patrol, he has a start and ending mileage for that patrol car. And then if, when he fuels up, he or she fuels up yep. at their own individual car, that portion for that goes under the 259 millage budget okay. for gas, fuel, and oil. So that's that's how we break it down or how it's shown each when we get the bill from few, the fuel place it has the individual's names on them because they have unique pins. So when we see that we know like when Deputy Vetter's name comes up on the fuel bill we know that's Marine Grant. So it's not tied to the vehicle at all? No, only the mileage is tied. I mean we can track the mileage based on who used it but the gas card is where the cost is, and that's based on the deputy's name and unique pin number. Or is it? Oh, there's still two fuel cards, right? One for the car and one for the officer, correct or not? No, no. just one. No. Is there one, just one no. fuel card now? Just one fuel card, and what makes it unique is they each have their own pin. Right. So when they put their pin in, that identifies as the deputy. Right. And when the bill breaks down, it has their name on the bill, and that's how what we use to put it to the each different budgets. And I, when I was working, there were two cards, one for the car and each officer had a card. Yeah. So that yeah. you knew. You could drive three different cars in a day and you knew what that officer put it in. Yeah, now you got to put it all on your daily. If you got to switch cars, you got to put it on your daily because yeah. there's not that option anymore because there's only just one card. So Mr. Uh, did you have more? Yeah, I'm just, you know, I, I think uh, the three year lease or whatever you you guys want to go with is, uh, is definitely something the look into with all of our vehicles, but we need to be concerned about uh, how far we're going out with these leases um, because of a millage that could pass or not pass. Um, and we don't want to get too extended out on something that we signed a contract on. We can't pay for it. That's why, I, that's why the three year, that's why I and there, there as well. It's, it's... I think the average um, life expectancy of your vehicles and not maybe, maybe not this vehicle, but for patrol vehicles is what, about three or four years based on the average mileage that I've been seeing. Um, wear and tear. So you're going to want to get rid of them after three or four years anyway. Well, and see, this is another reason why we want to go with start replacing them with Tahoe's. Mm -hmm. The resale value on a Tahoe right now is, is crazy. You, you can get, you go online and look at a, a five year old Tahoe with 200,000 miles on it, and they're still wanting 25,000 for it. Yeah. Right, but that's going to change. I mean, gas prices are going through the roof, and there's no end in sight to that. Well, that so is that is true. going to change. That is very true, not, and that's just that you don't know. But as of current, I always just drive big cars. That's the ah. that's other thing is you, I, I wouldn't get too um. How many times? I wouldn't sign these contracts for multiple vehicles each year. I would spread it out. You know, each year just a couple of vehicles because what happens if all of a sudden there there's not a good viable option to lease. And now we got to buy vehicles to get them replaced. Right. No. So it's just very true. It could change at any time. Yeah. Um, Tim, do you have? I'm sorry. Just keep that out there. Tim, do you have any input? Yeah, we just touch on repair and maintenance. Yeah. What happens with the lease? Is it all out of our pocket? Is the the, the 
the repairs. It depends on if we want to break it down. If, if the vehicle is utilized 75% of the time for the grant stuff and 25% for general counting, if we put four new tires on it, the county or the grant will buy three and the county will pay one. I mean, we'll break it down like that. I think um, you're asking more on a warranty question. Right. right. So, so if like you that. have a, yeah. Uh, but the, that's, that's kind of the, the breakdown on it. Um, if, if, if that vehicle is found, you know, if that vehicle is used for <clears throat> strictly for the whole week of just pulling a vehicle or pulling a boat, which sometimes happens, you know, over three, four days throughout the week, that, that is all goes under that grant. Right. But I, it comes think, out of our pocket. It's not something that's picked up by the person that holds a lease or less our No, it, 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 that all comes out of the county, okay. but and then it's being reimbursed by the state for that. Is there a warranty on the vehicle? Absolutely. There's another normal factory warranty. What do you mean by reimbursed by the state? I thought we're using these grants. There's a set Whatever. amount we're getting for these grants. Right, it is. But you have to put in for the reimbursement for those, for this. On top of what we've already received for that grant? No. No, no. The Marine grant has, like last year was 8,700 was what we were awarded for the Marine, Marine grant. So we had budgeted out and part of that is fuel and gas repairs, yep. break that down. So at the end of it, we don't get that up front. We budget it, we're awarded 8,700. We go through the fiscal year and then we submit for everything. So where we spend the money. You have to show where you so, spend that money. Yep, In order yep. to reapply for that, yep, right. you have to spend that money. So you get the reimbursement, then you apply for the next one. So one year we might be a little bit higher in repairs mm -hmm. because we had something, there might be a few less hours that were spent out on the lake because of that type of thing. But at the end of the day, we're going to get that $8,700. Well, Tahoe is going to cost more for gas, for repairs, for tires, for everything. What about damages? Damages. Get it here. Oh, no, that would be the insurance. 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 Yeah. So, yeah. Basically, it would be just like, as far as that goes, it's like buying it. Um, it's so different than buying it. This is just a payment program. It's all the payment program. That's all this. Yep. We, when I was working, that's what we did. We never bought cars. We leased every day on going car that we had. You know, yep. We leased them through Ford Motor Credit when we were driving Crown Vest. So we did three year leases on them. We owned, paid them the dollar at the end of the three year lease. And we it could worked go, out really well. So. We could go to a bank and ask them to they'd give us a three year program. Your three year loan on a car, and what kind of rates would they give us? The problem with that, though, is that it's not a state will pay, then the state state won't pay pick any of them. Okay, well, we still get buying. that funding though that $8,500. If we can find other ways to, um, never mind, other okay. ways to spend it, we, we, we basically have to show them the, the, the lease agreement with Ally or GM Financial, whoever we end up with. We have to show them that lease that we are actually leasing that vehicle. Is my understanding, and instead of being, we can't purchase it. We can't go through a. So moving forward, if if we do this option, part of the budget building in the different grants will be also the lease line item. So we'll indicate yeah. that. So that'll be the, the difference. Right. So then my next question, besides payments and everything else, say they they got they got one in stock. They bring it up here next week. Just. Hmm. Not that they will, but <laughs> just if they do, are you retiring a car next week? No. When are you going to retire the next car? My or our plan is by at least one by the end of the fiscal year to rotate one out, maybe two, but moving forward, at least one. So what are we going to do with all the equipment that's on that car? We don't sell the cars with equipment on them. No, the, the equipment is taken off of them. If it can be used for the next car, like if it was a Tahoe that was taken on and we, we get a Tahoe, we put that equipment back into that. And if you don't? And if you don't, then it's stored in the in the back and until back we here right now from the last there's, car. There's, oh, there's a bunch of stuff. <laughs> <Then> <laughs> <laughs> why are we putting that on some cars? Because it doesn't uh, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. Oh, come on. No, wait, don't, don't, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Radar tools oh the radar flashlights. Stuff. flashlights fit in another car yeah the flashlights well, and that's $3,500 you got here yeah for equipment 
Well, that's, that's what I'm talking about. That'll be just for the well, radar. If I can save enough money by putting other stuff in cars, then I can buy more cars. Right. All right. Yeah. Let's we're moving take a look stuff. at this on a, you know, I'm not just trying to be cheap here. I'm trying to get you more vehicles. By spending $26,000 extra on a car, 24, 88, 25,000 in two cars, I can buy another car. Here's the problem. And it's not a problem. It's actually like $4,500 $4, is for a new radio. Um, yeah. Just the cost. That's what the cost is. But you got one out of the car that you just parked. But the reason we're, those are old yes. radios. Wait a minute, wait a minute. If we kept that car okay. as a backup car, that radio isn't old anymore. We'd be using it as a backup. It will work out. Absolutely. If we keep the car, it's not an old radio. If we get rid of it, it's an old radio. I think now, wait a minute. I think the question on the table right now is this vehicle lease. I, I think we I think we can further discuss this, but just moving forward at this point in time, this vehicle lease option, is this something you guys want put on? Are you looking for an approval now or you, for the next meeting? Well, is this something we're going to discuss? Course. This is kind of a time sensitive thing because Burger is actually holding. How many cars are they holding for us? Right now? Yeah. One. This Tahoe. But, this Tahoe. But he does have a couple. Um, that's totally up to you guys. But he is, he is basically said he would hold one until today. And I could let him know where you guys are thinking. Or what how it happened? Would well, you guys I'm like this? I got sixty grand. Would you like this put on for a resolution for the I, next I meeting? Do guard. But if we get to, yes. we get a yes. Would you like this put on the next meeting for a resolution? Well, yeah, but I mean, right now he's asking one car here, but really you really want two, two for the fiscal year, yeah. So the second one, waiting on the USDA, 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 USDA comes back, then we'll. Come back and just switch. I got sixty thousand in the in the budget, and you're mm -hmm. asking me to spend. You're asking me to spend some half some that on one car. I'm sure that we're going to be discussing here in a few weeks too. So if we didn't need to spend all of that on cars. That would be okay. Why do we want to spend all of this right now? <laughs> I'm not sure you do. Uh, yeah. I think, well, I think you need to wait. I think you need to wait and see what the USDA grants. Yeah. So you do not want this put on for resolution? Yes, for that's what I'm asking. One vehicle. One vehicle. You do not give your opinion. So yes for or one no. Vehicle. Yes. But I think you still need to wait. All right. We're buying this grant. vehicle at the same price as the 21. Right. Now we wait. What's the price of a 22? We will get a 22. These are 22s. Okay. These are 22. Well, the, we, what, We've been told that the price going forward is going to be higher for the Tahoe. Well, yeah, it will be sure because we're, not we're getting get 21's it. price. Right. What's 22's price? About $3,000 more. About $3,000 more. So you ask the question, why are we buying more cars now? Because I can save $3,000. That's my answer. Yep. Now, if I can find a way to save a little bit more money by maybe using an old Motorola, there, there's what a lot more to that, Craig. I'll tell you later. Well, I, this and question has been on my on my tongue for five years now <laughs> about all the equipment that got taken off cars. Wait, by the amount of by the amount of what if we wait? Can I, Commissioner Scott, we're going to put the, this equipment on the next agenda. Be if we get, I'm sorry, you got a time limit, but we're here to discuss a break. And again, we have an agenda and we have a form to follow. That is not on there. A sweeter deal if we go for two. I don't know. Yeah, it would really change the price. No, it's the same price. No, it's, it's, so we have five yeses to put this on for the next. For one. For one, for this lease agreement for that they came here to ask us about for the resolution okay. for the next meeting. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. That's for two cards. We, can always we have F, Tom Spencer, Information Technology Director. Come on down, Tom. Price is right. <laughs> Did you uh, what's that? Go ahead. Uh, Nobody asked me for a break, so go ahead. Okay. <laughs> uh, basically, when I brought the x ray repair quotes to the um, community the whole last time, there was a couple of questions about, you know, versus a machine, or instead of getting a maintenance plan, just paying for the repair outright. So that's what I did. Uh, I went out and I reached out to Smith's Detection, got a quote for a new machine, basically $33,000 um, as the first box. And 
the second boxes, you basically already saw that same information. I do have a question on that though. I, I, I cannot get a straight answer out of these people. If you go with one or two years, I can include a 25% discount off the repair. I don't know if that's parts, labor above. I, I have not gotten a straight answer out of them. And I, I keep asking the same question, wording it differently and coming up with basically the same result. Um, box three is a repair option. Number two, basically a thousand dollars to um, do the evaluation and $210 an hour for repair and $185 for travel. And I imagine that's not including parts. So <laughs> I don't know what you guys want to do with this machine. Where did it come from? That I don't know, I didn't ask. Um, <laughs> I did reach out to the our medical examiner's recommendation for and he's a GE rep and I never heard back so I think that they're probably proprietary to their machines and I think that um, when Brian Hart recommended that um, I, I asked but I never got a reply and I think it's because it's not a GE machine we don't have any idea how much it's going to cost to fix that machine because we don't know what's wrong with it and they won't they won't tell me anything about the errors that we're getting and I know why. They're not going to tell us for free. I mean, you're not right. going to take your car to a dealership and say, hey, tell me what's wrong with it and we'll take it somewhere else to get it fixed for less money. So, Well, do you think we could get a diagnostic call where they could come and give us an idea of what's wrong and how much it's going to cost to repair it versus jumping to this $21,000, $32,000? They sure will for repair option number two. Which is? nine ninety nine to quote. There it is. $210 an hour. and $1,000. $185 bucks. an hour for travel. Yep. We should, be so, we should all be so lucky to get that amount of money, huh? I, I, I know, but say it's something <laughs> simple. I mean, $1, say... $1. They won't tell me that information. Yeah, I'll send that. them the error. <laughs> what would you guys like to do? We need to make a decision on this. Or is this machine going to be part of the discussion with the ARPA funds? That's, I, that was my thought, but... My thought is, for the amount of money I want to charge to look at it, Take it back to Ross County. Say thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but you're looking at thirty-two thousand dollars. So say it's something simple and you lived without it. Is it a necessity now? This is the big question. Is it nice? Yes. Is it a necessity? There's the question. So what would you like to do? Your opinion? I don't want to have anything to do with that machine. <laughs> I don't want to put one dime into it. Hey, Commissioner Vaughn. If if you purchase a new one. Will they take that one? Offer $1,000. I'm sure it's not quoted in, <laughs> it's not in Ross Commons. It was for for $1,000, they would take it. Correct. Yeah. Disposal of existing x-ray machine for Ross Commons quote was $1,000. So so we saved Ross Commons $1,000. You saved Ross Commons. We could take it. Ross Commons. Ross Commons. By dragging it over here. Commissioner Newbecker, your opinion. I don't, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't recommend repairing it. And uh, I, I agree with Mark. I think we should uh, maybe discuss it later in the ARPA. But no, nope. for right now, I don't want. I I just leave it alone. Throwing away good money after bad. Now, during our security meetings, they have given um, statistics as far as how many weapons. I we haven't had a meeting in a while that has been caught with that machine, and it was pretty substantial. The last uh, nice. recall with that, and and I'm Mr. Peter, you can probably uh, uh, collaborate that. It was it was a surprising amount of. Uh, Findings that they found with that machine when it was working. Correct. And uh, actually, not to discriminate, but it was mostly women with purses who had something in the bottom of it that they didn't realize <laughs> that they had for right. five, 10 years in the bottom of their purse. It was a, it was a pocket nice. knife or something. Yeah. I mean, it was, that's basically what they said. They were catching a lot more things in purses that were at the bottom. It seemed like it was a couple, couple <laughs> handguns, though. Oh, yeah. yeah. Commissioner Scott, we're discussing the new machine that he got the estimate for $32,981 or option uh, two with a service call of $999, $210 an hour, travel $185 an hour to get a diagnostic on the current one. Yeah, I'm getting adjusted. Do you have an opinion? Well, it's not being used enough. You know, I'm disappointed. I really, I don't want to go without it, without one. But at the same time, if they're not going to use it for everybody, I, I don't know why we're spending the money. Um, I was very enthusiastic that we were getting that machine from Cross Commons. We bet it didn't work out. But 
uh, no, I'm, I'm fine with not fixing that one. But if I was assured that they were going to use a new one, I would say okay. I, I agree with you, and I hate just picking and choosing too many people well, not I, to can use I speak it. Up on behalf of the security committee? Um, I think I think right now, as far as a re, uh, repair existing, I mean, I also hate to not if, wonder if it is something simple, and this could be fixed with with fifteen hundred dollars. Jenny, I, I, hang on, Karen. For the fifteen hundred dollars, I would hate if this was a simple repair. Um, I, so, is that something that that would never be another question question for the ARPA funds? You know, well, to, to look at a diagnostic versus a a new machine? It's all fair game for ARPA, all of it. Russ Common got rid of it for a reason. <laughs> I heard Aaron doesn't have one. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, just off the top of your head, um, of all the people that you found things on, were they headed to court or were they headed for just general uh, first floor up business? Bolt, bolt. Bolt. Going upstairs, courts, lobby, the clerk's office, or the treasurer's office. I can tell you right now, I don't work down there that much, but it sure is nice when it works. I mean, you're around somebody's purse, you're there, you do not have to sit there and take the call through the first, right? Offense taken, right? Um, out, there's a lot, that's a lot of stuff in there you have to go through. Not to that great machine, it just gets a lot smoother, quicker, and get people through quicker. Can you go without it? Absolutely. You know, That's what my question is, is you know, to check every single person that comes in here to see the clerk's office or or other other offices on the bottom floor, is that worth you know the time that you got to put into that? versus just protecting um, the stairway so that they can't go up to the courts um, with all that stuff in their purse. I, I, so. Unfortunately, in today's age, I think the whole, they should cover everybody. They can get just as bad as the clerk as they can. The well, they, do, they can do that in any business in town too. Absolutely. So you can't protect everything. I'm just trying to say, I'm, I'm trying to decipher um, the, the amount of people that were holding up from coming into the building to do this, and the fact that we're not even doing it half time anyway, um, is it really worth that? Uh, I'm trying to think of the word, um, not, not convenience, but the opposite. Uh, inconvenience. Inconvenience of having to come through one door into the building when we could just protect the courts. And um, I think that's what the whole purpose of that machine was to begin with was to uh, protect the courts. I like the machine. So. You and I have had this discussion. I like the machine. I, I it, highly in favor of it. I think everybody should go through it. Um, I, I do. In a minute, Karen. Yep. Well, I, I guess my, it comes back to, you know, if we're going to have it, then uh, I would hope that we would actually use it. And I don't see that mm -hmm. happening already. So do we really need this thing? It may not be a bad that's, idea to have the, the before we make a decision on this, to have the head of security come to our meeting and give his input on it. It would be nice for everybody to hear those statistics like we've heard um, and possibly give us some feedback. I think they should have some input on this. Well, regardless, can you just make it mandatory that everybody that comes to the door is checked? Well, I think we need to ask him versus hearsay what we've seen of the individual, wait. the head of security, what is happening and if, why. If you got to wait an extra... 30 seconds or a minute to get through oh well get to work a few minutes early i mean i always show up. every time you I, leave every time you come in i don't, I don't time care lunch, i don't care i show so up how, half an hour 45 minutes of, to everything i go are, to are you time. are you guys okay with, are you guys okay with that. having security exactly. the head of security come into the next meeting can we ask him tim karen did you have input i do please the security committee please keep in mind did you consider replacing this that the security committee did report to the state that we have a metal detector. I don't think it will look good from a security standpoint if we downgrade and get rid of that detector. Since we've already reported to the state, that's part of our security system. That's information that again, can we ask him to come and report to us? Good point. Before we make a decision. 
if you guys want to, I can send us to Mike Bowers. I don't, he's got some grant money coming down. That's never quick, obviously, but we've already talked about that. But if you want me to send a quote to him, I will. Please. Say it's on the radar. I'd rather have one than not have one. But I, like Watsky's been all along as everybody, everybody gets checked. Nobody goes to an airport and gets let go through the thing. How about we, again, we put this on for him to come and give input yeah. as far as uh, all the guidelines and recommendations and, okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Yep, the TV cart. Yep. <laughs> what? The cart. Uh, we were talking, Tim and I were talking actually, so with Mid Michigan using the annex building and there used to be a projector and everything over there um, for presentations. And there's some things that happen over there after hours. I put together, uh, basically I took the previous cart, same exact cart that we got here and updated the quote for it, um, $3,561 to put a rolling cart over there just like this in the annex building with the Logitech group microphones and everything. So they can do Zoom meetings after hours. Um, Mid Michigan did kind of spark it off, but I know Ryan's got quite a few meetings over there. I'm sure we probably for PowerPoints and everything, MSU for presentations. I wouldn't mind putting a projector over here, but then it's tied to that wall. <laughs> right. You know, this is, mm -hmm. you can wheel this around, you can turn it around because there's two sets of tables over there. There's the curtain. You can get out of the building if need be, too. Well, that's kind of what sparked it because I don't really want to drag this over there for minutes. No, Michigan. no, but <laughs> I can, but it will it be just as large as this? The same exact setup. Right. Um, I think the card is a slightly different brand, but. Um, it's the same setup. This is on the agenda here because it's not a budgeted item. So if the board agrees to do this, we'll put together a resolution to take that funding out of contingency, which has in excess of 12,000 in it yet. So plenty there, but there isn't any funding within anybody else's allocation to pay for it. Well, you're looking at renting this, if I read that correctly, the, the draft building usage. I mean, having this could increase Rental, correct? It could, but it's certainly in line with where technology is today. Absolutely. It's almost expected. So. Questions for Tom? Commissioner Vaughn? Good. Commissioner Becker? Good. Commissioner Scott? Oh, I like this. I'm good. Okay, so we'll have that on yep. for the next okay. meeting. We know where the funding is going to come from. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Tom. Sounds good. Thank you. Hey. I'll see you at the gym. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Veter. Hi. Okay. Hi. Okay. So I sent you a massive pack of tax amendments the Planning Commission has been working on. Um, kind of a, I believe one of those, there's a brief explanation of those as well, too. Um, these will have to be approved by the county commissioners before they can go into effect. And I'm here to see if there's any questions. About these. There wasn't a whole lot. You highlighted all the yellow stuff that was changed, correct? You, you um, on, on a few of them, yeah. Um, in particular, the, the first one, the chapter one, the definitions, that's new. Um, number two, section 2.29 for efficiency dwelling units, that is completely new. Um, three, just a couple of minor changes to the minimum requirements for dwellings outside of manufactured homes. Those were highlighted as well. Um, <laughs> sections 13.3 14.3 .3 are new or changing existing language uh, 5 section 2.10 replace C and add D that's kind of a, a change and an add as well 6 is new 7 is um, replacing what was there with the signs which that majority of that section is all brand new as well too Questions, comments? Mr. Scott? Well, I'm totally involved in, in all this uh, on the Planning Commission. We talked about this in great length, uh, just about every one of these um, topics. And some over months, the, uh, the smaller home that was something we talked about for at least eight months. And basically it's reducing the size of, of, of the minimum living space. And uh, what uh, 
let me know that the, the building is still built to exact <coughs> it's not to uh, it is only really uh, just reducing the size of the living space the minimum living space of a home we were at 720 before now we're the tax amendment is 400 square foot but the house still has to be built to code that's electrical, you know, electrical plumbing, drywall, the insulation. This is not okay somebody to buy a shed and call it a house. And that was something that was, uh, everybody on the, on the planning commission agreed wholeheartedly. Really in this day and age too, it, it, it kind of helps um, affordability as well, too. Um, a lot of people are looking at those tiny homes, so to speak. Um, they're, they're smaller footprints, they're, they're more affordable. Um, example would be today, a 720 square foot home at $150 a square foot to build would be about $108,000. Um, 400 square foot home for, for an individual at $150 a square foot would be about $60,000. So, uh, it, it does make it more affordable. Um, there, there's a lot of old cottages here in Oldham County that are four or 500 square feet as well too. So it's more or less going back to, to kind of that cottage, small footprint, um, maybe for individuals that want a second home or, or a cottage or for individuals just starting out as well too. It's a more affordable option, but at the same time, um, they'll be safe, they'll be up to code um, and they'll be taxable as well too as you, as you've gone through here i don't know if you've noticed um we we i'm having a particular issue with with people living in campers so this this is this is a better option for those people um because we know we know it's safe uh, regardless of whatever anyone tells you recreational vehicles are not designed to live in. So uh, they cannot, they will not pass building codes. So uh, this is something that would help those people that, that, are, that are starting so as well too. How come the definition of the campground, why was that important to put in here? Um, more or less to define the, and, and this is more or less from the state, any, anything with five or more recreational units on it is considered a campground. Um, and I don't know if it was super necessary to put it in there, um, but to kind of define it, um, camping is not defined in our ordinance, um, where campgrounds are typically defined in most zoning ordinances. Um, so more, more or less just to, to, to show people if you have five or more units on a lot, it is basically considered a campground and it's licensing from, from the state of Michigan, so. Commissioner Serbrook. Commissioner Vaughn. Commissioner Newbecker. No. So there was nothing in here about the actual, uh, Commissioner Scott had brought to us the dates were gonna be changed. That I did not see in here. Is that not where this belongs as far as you talked April 1st to November 30th? It's this, that's not there and it's in there. Yeah, we're, um, I looked through, maybe it just wasn't there. highlighted. I didn't read, no, it's not highlighted, yeah, it's not but highlighted. I didn't see it highlighted. It's almost to the point. <laughs> it's on page 10 or 11. I'm at, a, I'm at 11, 14 days. I see the 14 add, days. Add, to replace C and add D section 2.10. It's after the where he's got highlighted in the mini storage garages. Storage on lots contained. It's, it's the next, next page down. Because I had some individuals asking about it last night. So I just wanted to make sure. Do you have it? Because going through my packet that I printed from the packet I sent you. I don't have it. I don't see it. I, I see, have the 14. I see D and the current camping, but I don't see. Current camping regulations and storage on vacant lots. Paragraph, I, I think paragraph five. Paragraph five. 
there in paragraph five. But there's not the dates. It says yeah, so okay. days. April first through not in mind. November thirtieth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't I don't have that. What page? <laughs> Well, according to this, it says page 10. Do you see it? Oh, uh, here. Hmm. It's not in my packet. Said, oh. Yeah, page 10. There's page 10. Next, check it out. Next one. Oh. December 31st. Right here, April 1st. Okay, it is there. I'm sorry. I was looking at the next. I was looking at page 11. Because they asked me to bring this next month. It's approved. They wanted to see this. Okay. That's really the only change with the camping. Um, kind of redesigned it a little bit, make it easier through the whole process. It was it was confusing on what's allowed on vacant properties, what's allowed on um, properties with a dwelling on it. So, kind of split that up a little bit, make it easier to read. And then the time frame is the biggest change instead of the the two hundred and seventy out of a three hundred sixty-five day period, which is different for every single camper, um, mm -hmm. the April first to November thirtieth is the type thing that that we went with, which is pretty standard for the ordinances that I've read. Um, when they def they define a time frame, that's usually the time frame they define. Um, and I found in my research were probably the most lenient municipality around when it comes to, to campers and camper storage. Um, most municipalities do not allow them for that type of time frame. Um, Adopting this, is this gonna help with some of the areas that are having such an issue with campers? Yeah, and the biggest issue I think with campers is there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of people that just don't know. And that's the majority of people that we've been seeing at the planning commission just either weren't aware um, that this has been in place since uh, it came up at our meeting last night, since at least 1997. 97 was the last revision. Then we were reminded by more of a inspector mm -hmm. said that most of that stuff was in effect even before the last revision. People were coming in, they were complaining about this 14 day within a 30 day period. That is not changing. We're not doing anything with that at all. And they're screaming at us that why are you putting this in? Well, it's been in there for 30 years. It's already been in there for 30 years. Why didn't you scream at us 30 years ago? You know? Is this something that maybe we should be uh, communicating a little bit more before this goes into effect? Like, should we put it in? All we're putting in effect is taking out the 270 days. Well, I know, out of a and year and put like you said, but there's a lot of people that don't even know half of this stuff. There, There is a... What was it two months ago? Was it our January or December meeting when we had um, the giant Facebook post that had thousands of views on it? Oh, yeah. I think throughout the whole process, we've, we've the information has gotten out there 10,000 times better than it ever has before. Um, and we, we keep hearing about a lot of that misinformation. So. Uh, I know at least a few months ago, it was a huge contingent on Facebook that was going crazy about it. Um, I know the Lake Ogama Association out there, I believe they have a discussion group that's been talking about it for months and months and months. So, um, like they said last night at the meeting, um, there was quite a few of them concerned about this 14 days as well. And, and I said, is unless you're doing something wrong or um, there's not going to be a complaint, you're not going to be bothered. <clears throat> that's the gist of it. Um, that one of the biggest complaints we got from individuals is um, I think previously and, and a lot most municipalities require a permit for that. Um, these individuals want nothing to do with having to get a permit to camp on their own property. So really from an enforcement standpoint, if they're pulling a permit telling you when they're going to be there and when they're going to leave, that's a little bit more enforceable. I'm dealing with a property here, a property there, but that's not the case. So um, that time frame kind of helps define it. Instead of having 500 campers, that 200 or that 270 days expires, um, and actually it makes it fair for everybody that has a camper. Now everybody is, if you're connected to well and separate, because April 1st to November 30th. This guy over here isn't different because he didn't start till May 4th, or this guy's not different because he started in October. So um, it will help with that. Okay. It will help with that. But you don't go looking for problems. You only respond to problems. Correct. Now, 
occasionally if I see something that's a safety issue, then, right. then I will. Obviously, I think I feel entitled to do something about it. Um, but generally, for the most part, I'm not driving around looking at cameras. Right. <laughs> I'm not driving in the middle of somebody's 10 acre parcel because I, I got a hot tip that they have a camper back there. More or less complaint driven. So. so we need this put on for a resolution? Yes. Are you guys okay with that, Mr. Vaughn? Commissioner Becker? Absolutely. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Anything else? Passed by us. Any questions or anything? You guys have my number. You know how to get a hold of me. Feel free to. You changed your cell phone. No. I've got the new one. <laughs> I do now. I do now, but I had to get it. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks. Session items. Is there anything on there that you for sure want to hit on today? I, I think all of those can go to the next Cal meeting. I'm, I'm kind of nervous because I know what your timetables are, and I've got an idea of how long this closed session is going to take. So. Okay. I mean, I can, at the 5.30, Kyle, we can stay all night long. Yeah. So um, unfortunately, I, I, I wasn't aware that this was going to be quite so lengthy or I would have made different accommodations. So I apologize for that. So um, now we close sessions. You want to do a public like, comment? Correct, correct. But, but we are going to do close, uh, close session, correct? Yeah, well, yes. So we're going to jump to five public comments. This is uh, for any subject matters, three minutes, please. Um, public comment in the room. Public comment in the room? Public comment on the phone. No public comment on the phone. We're gonna go into closed session and there will be no business coming out of closed session, correct? Right. Is there, motion to go into closed session. Isn't there something uh, I have to read here? There is uh, number six on your pad on oh, the very yeah. bottom. Oh, You'll right. see the motion. Dang it. Where are we here? Item six, you said. Right. Yes, I read that last night. A closed session is scheduled to consult with attorney Timothy Farron about three items of the litigation addressed through the county liability insurance carrier. Do I need to read those? You don't. If anybody asks, these are what they are. That's uh, next. I need a, oh, I'm sorry. I need a motion to enter into closed session to consult the county attorney regarding specific pending litigations as permitted under Open Meetings Act. Pardon me? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear him. So we have a motion yes. with support from Commissioner Sorek. Can we have a roll call vote? Jenny David. Yes. Craig Scott. Yes. Ron Vaughn. Yes. Brad Newbecker. Yes. Mark Sorek. Yes. You're going to go into closed session at 1056. Okay. You, um, I would suggest that the sheriff be included in that. Okay. Bye, guys. Thanks for coming. Mr. Farron. He can. I mean, it's up to you. Forward. Is Mr. Farron on? I would. I think by Zoom? Paul should be. He is. He should be. Sure. Yeah. He is on. Not on yet. He should be any second. Our plan is not otherwise spoiled. Okay, just got the acknowledgement. You will be signing in momentarily. I can. Okay. We'll make a motion and we go back into open session. Support. All right, Commissioner Scott made a motion to come back into session, supported by Commissioner Serbrook. A roll call vote. Ron. Yes. Brad. Yes. Craig. Yes. Mark. Yes. Make a motion to adjourn. Support. <laughs> Mr. Scott, motions to adjourn. Mr. Serbrook supports. Yes. Aye. 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 Thank you, Tom. Roll call.